talking lately about biological warfare. Germs, you know? You know where they got that? From us. No, they don't realize how far ahead of them we are in biological warfare. I could tell you some things, but there are secrets that even I can't tell. They'll find out, though. Remember, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Something else to think about, too. As I said, they hate us. But most of their time is taken up in hating each other. So they don't have the time to attend to us as they should. They're absolutely ruthless, though, when they do think about exterminating us. I know. I nearly got it once. Want to hear about it? Well, can you take it? Quiet, please. Quiet, please. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents the third of a series of unusual dramatic programs written and directed by Willis Cooper and featuring Ernest Chappell. This story is called We Were Here First. Yes, yeah, I'll tell you a story. You keep asking for stories, I'll tell you one that'll really give you something to think about. You'll keep thinking about the story till you die. Then I have an idea you'll pass it on to the ones who come after you, just as I'm passing it on to you. So you listen, Captain. Yeah? <laughs> This one doesn't start with once upon a time. It's about the world today, so that once upon a time business does come into us. Listen. Do you know there are giants in this world? Oh, yes, there are. Did you think we were the only ones here? You're wrong. There are giants. Millions of them. Billions. Giants so big that it's almost Impossible for one of us to imagine how big they are. Why, a hair from the head of one of them is as big as your leg. And they're everywhere, in the cold lands, in the hot lands, everywhere. And they hate everybody. They hate each other. And they hate us. Oh, how they hate us. How they'd like to get rid of it. But I'll tell you something. They're not going to. We were here first. And we're going to be here a long, long time after they're gone. For they're going to go. Don't fool yourself about that. They can't win. <laughs> But it isn't going to be easy. Don't fool yourself about that either. They've killed an awful lot of us in all the millions of years they've been on this earth. And I may say we've killed quite a few of them. We've killed more of them than they have any idea. And that, my child, is quite a trick when you consider the difference in our time. How big are they? Well, that's hard to explain. We're all different sizes, you know. Some of us are small, some of us are And there are fat ones amongst us and thin ones. And they're the same way. But on the average, I should say they're, uh, oh, about 150 times as tall as we are. Oh, yes, 150 times our size, Matt Mountain. But there's an old saying, child, and this is something you want to remember. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. I don't want to give you the idea, Paul, that it's going to be easy to win. I've nearly lived my life out, and there's just as many of them as ever. You live your life out, and your children and your children's children will live and die in generations that you can count up in trillions, and they'll still be here. And we'll all of us pay an awful price in this time. 
But we breed fast and our families are locked. Then one day, one day there'll be no more giants in the earth and we'll have it all to ourselves. Brethren dwelling together in unity. That's one of their sayings, too, but they disregard it pretty much. They don't dwell together in unity any more than we do. And that's the bad part of the unity. If we just have to stop to get together, if we just stop fighting amongst ourselves. Now, of course, it's all right for them to fight amongst themselves. That simplifies our problem. Someday, if we're lucky, Maybe they'll all kill each other. They try hard enough. Oh, I tell you, they've got weapons, child. They've got an atomic bomb. It works. And some of them are scared to death that it may one day wipe them all out. But we'll see. If it does, good riddance. And our day comes a little sooner. If it doesn't, well, we've got to hide. They've got to talking lately about biological warfare. Germs, you know? You know where they got that? From us? No, they don't realize how far ahead of them we are in biological warfare. I could tell you some things, but there are secrets that even I can't tell. They'll find out, though. Remember, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. It's a mighty comforting spot. Something else to think about, too. As I said, they hate us. But most of their time is taken up in hating each other. So they don't have the time to attend to us as they should, if they want to continue to exist. They're absolutely ruthless, though, when they do think about exterminating us. I know. I nearly got it once. Want to hear about it? Well, can you take it? Well, this is just one of the concentration camps they run in between the times they're planning how to exterminate the job. They call this place New Jersey. But it's not New Jersey to us. Some of us call it Thanatopolis. That's Greek. It means city of death. Greek? Oh, the Greeks lived on this earth a long, long time ago. There's some of them left today, but uh, they're not the same as they were then. They got careless. All that's left of their glory is words like Thanatopsis. Words that have the sound of death in them, child. I was hungry. That's how I got caught. That's the way a lot of us get caught. Plenty of food, plenty of good, healthy food. Plenty to drink. Nothing to do but get fat and get killed. I didn't know about giants in those days. I know now. The gate was wide open. And I tell you, it was the pleasantest place I've ever seen. I looked it over, I smelled the food. Oh, I tell you, I've been around and I never smelled anything so delicious in all my eyes. I just went crazy as long as I know. Well, the food was just as good as it smelled, and there was plenty of it. I lost my way going in. It's a, it's a kind of a labyrinth, you see, and I was interested in the food. I, I was hungry. There was a lot of us in there. I recognized hundreds of friends, fat. Happy, well fed. And I stayed there quite a while. I got that too. But there were sounds I didn't like. Sounds like failure. Listen, things that came from nowhere at all. And the feeling of someone watching us, someone laughing. <laughs> and one day, one morning early, I heard a voice. This one's about ready, I think. Just look at him. <laughs> thousands and thousands of them, and not one of them was tense enough to try to get out. I looked up. That sounded like a human voice to me. Get the gas ready. They've had a good time now long enough. You see how long it takes him to die. It was a human voice. A giant voice. 
That particular concentration camp of theirs was run by one of their toenails. Probably, according to their standards, a very beautiful one. To me, as I looked up at her face far above me, she looked like all of the years of death I'd ever dreamed of. A child, she was dead. Where's the stopwatch? Paralyzed, I, I watched her great fingers wind her stopwatch. So stiff with terror, I saw the nozzle of the gas generator slither into the door far across the floor. I began to crawl toward the door, toward the gaping mouth of that gas jet. I tried hard to warn a few of my friends, but they were heavy with good living and it was useless. I found my way through the labyrinth somehow, hoping, hoping I'd be kind. I had a goal now, if I could make it. And then I saw a razor hand with a watch. I heard her... Put on the gas! The long, tiny sense of the gas, the long, short, infinitesimal breath of it, when I thought my heart would leap from my body. My eyes burned, my legs refused to hold me up, and fell and staggered and fell and staggered again. And as I stumbled out into the blessed freshness of the air, I heard the sound of the and her laugh. <laughs> Look at him. Look at him crawl and wiggle. This is the best gas we've used. Look at him. Three seconds, four seconds, and every one of them dead. This is wonderful. I was dazed. My mind couldn't cover such loss. Full of sex and countless thousands of them. And then, and then, this is the horror. You know what she did? She gathered up their still warm bodies and tossed them onto a great scale and weighed them. Why? So she could know how many of us she had killed in four seconds. Do you wonder we hate them? Do you wonder we live for nothing but the day when the giants, male and female and all their young, shall all be gone from this earth? So you see, it must be us or them. And I swear to you, Todd, we'll stay. We were here first. Most of the time, they forget we're here. And that's good, of course, because they're intelligent. They can fly trees. They have marvelous instruments that help them perform amazing things. They've got radar, for instance, but fortunately for us, their radar won't pick us up as ours does them. They've got methods of communication, but theirs aren't as good as ours. And the amazing thing is that most of the remarkable inventions they thought of and perfected are used for fighting one another. Let them keep on in that fight. Because, you see, there's one little point they never seem to think about. They fight amongst themselves. But we fight against both sides. And you know who wins their war? We do, child. We always have. We always will. We fly and them. No matter where they go, there's always one of us near them. There's not one single word spoken in the giant world that we don't hear. No matter what they plan, we know about it. And they're never free from us. They plan for their pledges, and we prepare to spoil their pledges. They plan for wars, and we mobilize our expeditions. They pray, and we hear them. And we answered their prayer sometimes with death. What do you mean? How? You think it's hard seeing our tight kill a bee the size of a giant? It isn't. You see, in the first place, we're willing to sacrifice a million bucks to kill one of them. No, that's true. 
Not all of us know about the science. Not all of us know that we're being sacrificed in this endless war. Some of us think we're dying a natural death, I suppose. But we leaders know. You still don't understand? Well, let me give you an example. I said the giants of the average, on the average, uh, perhaps 150 times as tall as we. Well, now, that's just height. If you know anything about mathematics, you realize that that means they're uncounted millions of times bigger than we are. In actual mass, it would probably take a than a billion of our bodies to make one the size of theirs. Uh, take an ant, for instance. How much bigger is a man than an ant? You see? So, on a plantation in South America... Toward us in a straight line, in a column 50 feet across, miles long. The beasts are king from me monkeys, deer, tapers, jaguars, ants. Tiny creatures only half an inch long. Soldier ants, hungry, leaving only the stripped skeleton of trees to mark the path they followed. Skeletons picked clean of the animals that fell in their way, stripped clean in a matter of minutes. Ants, tiny creatures, only half an inch long. They're coming. We've got to fight them. Fight them with flowing streams of water. And they come on. Fight them with jets of oil. Open the tanks. Drown them. Then some die, but they come on. Fight them with fire. Hey, fire here. Set the oil on fire. And some die, but they come on. Run, run. Don't let them get you. They poison in their jaws. Run, run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the brown river flows remorselessly on. <laughs> Tiny creatures, half an inch long. Then behind them, as the end of the Brown River disappears, a clean white skeleton and desolation. So you see, it isn't size, it's hatred and the will to conquer, and it's numbered. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. So, you haven't seen the giants? You just think you haven't, child. You're young yet, and you mistake them. Sometimes you think it's a cloud that obscures the sun. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. But don't waste time when a great shadow falls on the child. It might be one of the giants. And they strike without warning. It's a horrible death. You see, one of the things that makes living in the same world with the giants so terrible is the way they hate us. They hate us in an impersonal kind of a way. They kill us by habit, most of them. They say, there's one, kill him. And that's what we're to it. We never think about it, after. That, I think, is why we hate the most. Or of no consequence to them. That is, they think we're of no consequence. If they knew what we've done to them through all the countless ages they've been on this earth. <laughs> and perhaps it's a good thing they don't. They're scientists, no, though. And they've got some pretty good scientists when they're not thinking up ways to kill each other. And they know us. Some of them study us. And child, they're clever. They're the ones who thought of setting us against each other. They're war makers amongst themselves. Why shouldn't they apply their theory to us? And their theory work. We fight amongst ourselves. We do too much of it. And most of us don't know why we do. It costs a lot of lives, and the worst part of it is, it costs time. I don't say that they put us up to all the fighting. Some of us think of it ourselves. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe there'd be too many of us for our own good if we didn't kill each other. But if we could only get together, if we could only, all of us, see that one shining goal before us, think of a world that would belong to us all by ourselves with no giants to worry about. Not that all of us worry about the giants. That's just the trouble. We have to spend so much time convincing others that they really exist. 
that there are menace to us every second we live, and that we've got to destroy them. One day, if we don't learn to get together, they'll destroy us, Smith. They've destroyed a lot of us so far. And I hate to think of this world belonging to them exclusively. What? Oh, yes, of course. They wouldn't live without us. They need us. Some of them know that, even if we are as a race, a constant nuisance to them. But what's the good of that? If they destroy us, they'll die, too. And then there won't be anybody left in the world. But believe me, child, we don't need them. We got along a good long time before they appeared. Then we'll do it again. Nonsense? Superstition? <laughs> For you children. I know, though. I said the same thing when I was your age. But I found out different. Yes, there are giants. You'll find out. Certainly we can kill them. Didn't I tell you about the ants? Well, that's right. There were millions of them. But one of us can kill a giant. Just one of us. I'll tell you a story about that, and then you decide for yourself. This was in the last war out in China, a long, long way from here. Now, I know it's true. I got it from a friend of mine who was there. An airplane fell down in the valley between the mountains. The pilot had a broken leg. So for a week, he lay there in the valley all alone. And there was nothing wrong with him except for his broken leg. He had something to eat, and there was what? And he needn't have died, except that a bug of some kind bit him, and he got some strange fever. In the second week, he began to be delirious. And then one morning, he heard someone coming. Hello! I hear someone calling. Hello! I can't see anybody. Everything looks funny. Who, who are you? I'm coming. Who are you? Where's my gun? I have to have my gun. I don't know who's calling me. Where are you? I'll be quiet. I don't see the end. I'll wait. I see him. No. Yes, I do. You're not going to get me. Where are you? It's so big. It's a giant. Look at him. He's coming closer. A giant. I'll have to pull him. Wait. You brought me. You're not going to get me, giant. Get away from me, giant. Don't you touch me. Don't you come close. No, no. You're a giant. Think I don't know. You come to get me. No, no. Get away from me. I'll kill you. Easy, fella. Take it easy. No, no, get away. Get away, I say. I've got a gun. Put the gun away. Don't touch me. Stop. Stop. All right. I told you. I told you. I tell you. <laughs> I killed the giant. He killed one of them. It was very easy. It was very curious. A little later, when the evening came and the fever cooled a little, that the dead giant looked so much like his friend that had jumped out of the airplane a moment before he did. It was very curious. Well, all right, it was his friend. He thought his friend was a giant. And he killed him. Or did he kill him? Who fired the pistol at his friend that was the direct cause of his friend's death? But who was it that brought him a thief that made him think his friend with a giant? Remember? I said a little bug bit him. So the little bug was indirectly the cause of the other man's death. And to the little bug, the man was a giant. They were both giants. And he killed them both. Because the man who had killed his friend had a moment of lucid thought that his fading strength was enough to turn his pistol up to his feet. No, I know it's true. 
Well, maybe that is rationalizing, but you think it over. To my way of thinking, two giants got killed. And got killed. Am I a little slow in my thinking now that I'm... Look out! Quick, look out! All right. So you killed He was a child. And he didn't have a chance against the giant he didn't even believe in. He... Oh, oh, I'm not going to be emotional. There are too many more of us to worry about the death of one. You can smash us, you can poison us, you can get us to death. But we'll always be with Not to the end. And that's the world. You can't win. Without it. Ah, with him? He'll die. But listen for a second. We're everywhere. We're in the earth. We live in your houses. We eat your food. We watch you day and night. We've got senses you never dream of. We've got weapons that they have no defense. You walk and you're too late. We've got thick. You fly in your earth. We've got wings. You make your weapons. We are our own weapons. And if we insects ever get together, Giant, or maybe they won't have, maybe you'll blast yourselves off the earth and say, huh, your atomic bombs don't mean anything to us. The fly lives at Hiroshima, you know. The beetles are still alive on the sea. And far under the surface of this earth, he's sleeping. More and more millions of us are sleeping. Waiting for the day. Giant, we'll always be there. Wherever you go, while you're awake, while you're asleep. Aging, plotting again. Knowing that one day everything you've built, everything you've accomplished on this earth, will be ours. We were here first. And we'll be here last. There's a fine, isn't it? And there's a cloud of gnats somewhere outdoors waiting for you and all the rest of the giants we hate. Are you the one that was bragging about the, what did you call it, DDT? <laughs> fine. DDT does it. It kills the good in and the bad ones are. Let it try again, Giant. You can't live without us. And you can't live with them. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. We were here too. Think of that some night when a fat moth blunders in your bedroom window. Maybe he won't be blundering, Giant. Maybe he'll be Sorry. And remember, we're giant killers. Not so good, giant. <laughs> See you tonight. You're listening to Quiet Two, which is written and directed by Ernest Cooper. The one who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And the others were Nancy Douglas, Walter Black, and Kenneth Hurst. The music was composed and played by Gene Carrasso. And now for a word about next week's Quiet Please story, here is our writer director, Willis Cooper. Next week's story is called The Ticket, I think you'll find it in City and in its And so, until next week at this time, I am quietly young. Ernest Temple. <laughs>